Good morning, Stacy. Running a little behind just because I needed to make my coffee. But. All right. I'm not sure who's going to join in because it is one of those off days. But I totally forgot that last week, I think, or the week before last, I was supposed to do two sessions instead of one. And thankfully, I looked at my schedule and saw that. So. I am fixing that this week by doing both chapter 4 and 5 today and tomorrow. But um, I'm going to run through the things that I normally run through for those who are going to watch this later on for the replay or on YouTube. So the Bible that I'm using is the single column journaling Bible from ESV. And I have the just original black one. So it's from Crossway. I am taking all of the notes from the notes that I created you can get this on the blog if you want and then I have my two post-it notes the same ones that I've been using from the start the pens I will be using are the big round stick for my note taking on the post-its and then the Pigma Micron for inside of the Bible highlighting tools are going to be the Crayola super tips sharpie highlighters which are smear guards and then the zebra mile liners. I also have the Crayola twistable colored pencils. So those are the tools that I use. Um, I already went ahead and wrote out the definitions on the paper just so that we're not here too long. Move that out the way. And the process that I use for those who are new, basically what I do is I read first. So I would read like a paragraph or a whole chapter. It depends on how long it is. In this case, I go paragraph by paragraph. So I would read this paragraph first, then circle words that I want to define. And it can be words that I already know or words that I don't know. And I do this simply because I want to know what the definitions are in their original language and the new testament was originally written in greek so what i do is look up these words in the greek definition to fully comprehend and understand the context of the scripture for the time that it was written in and then after i do that i then go in back rereading it breaking down each verse by underlining and then after i underline i then make my notes box them and add color so that's pretty much it i'm going to do a quick prayer you guys know I am very shy when it comes to prayer, so yeah. Um, and if you guys hear like a little buzzing sound, I do have my heater on because it is extremely cold in this house. So yeah. Heavenly Father, we just come to you today just to give you glory, honor, and praise. We are thanking you for waking us up this morning and giving us working limbs and organs, Father God. I am asking that you, Holy Spirit, come into this study today that we may, we may be able to understand fully what you have for us to understand and that we may be able to apply it to our lives to be used on a daily basis. Amen. Alrighty, so I am going to start off with chapter 4. And there are 32 verses. I do have quite a lot of notes. <laughs> so I probably should have gotten an extra piece of paper. And I didn't. And I don't feel like going to get paper now. So I'm going to figure this out. I still haven't added the paper in like I said I would. It just never crosses my mind. But um, I'm going to make it work. So we're just going to start off with this portion here. And it's titled Unity in the Body in the body of Christ. So starting with verses 1 through 8. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gives gifts to men. So, we are now going to circle the words that I want to define. So I have walk, which is in verse 1, worthy, 
which is still in the same verse. Going to verse 2, I have humility, gentleness, and patience, I believe is the last word, yeah. And I know that the autofocus on Facebook Live sucks because when I put my hand in a way, it kind of comes out of focus. So hopefully Facebook fixed that someday where it would just like be locked into complete autofocus. But yeah, let me zoom in just a little bit. Okay. So we have walk worthy, humility, gentleness, and patience. So the Greek word for walk is here and it means to conduct life or live worthy is becoming of God appropriately humility is lowliness of mind or modesty gentleness is consideration and patience is long-suffering slowness in avenging wrongs and again these are Greek definitions they're different from English and from the Hebrew So I already wrote them down, like I said, because I don't want this video to be too long, or this session rather. So now we're just going to go in with some color, because who doesn't love color? All right, got that done. Gonna go back in now and underline the parts that I want to take notes on. So I'm gonna underline the portion that says a prisoner for the Lord. A prisoner for the Lord. So basically, once again, Paul reminds us that he is bound to Christ and that he may be in prison, but he remains faithful to his true captor, who is Christ. So basically, no matter what jail cell they have him in, no matter how much they torture, beat, abuse him, no matter what they say to him, he understands that even though man is currently keeping him captive, his real true captor is Christ and Christ alone. So, this true captor is Christ, not man. And I think that's just a cool reminder, period, because I feel like as people, we sometimes get caught up in what man is doing and not really focusing on God in Christ so for me personally this is a reminder that no matter what man says or does um, they may think they have a hold on me but it's more so God who has the real true hold on me then he says urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called so believers are to live a life that serves and obey God um, out of gratitude because he loved us not so that he will already sorry not so that he will because he already does and our life should be full of thankfulness so let me write that here believers should live a life that serves 
and obeys God. Out of gratitude. Life should be. I'm sorry, life should show our thankfulness. I do have two cross references, which are Colossians 1 and 20 and 1 Thessalonians 2 and 12. So the way that you basically live appropriately or rather how can I say we basically should live a life or conduct ourselves in a way that is becoming of God and God is a very loving God he's a very serving God um he he cares for all people so we should be like that and we should show that in our thankfulness and do it with a heart of gratitude and not because we want him to do something and um I know there have been times for me when I've done things and I've expected something out of it from him when I should have done them out of a heart of gratitude. And there's a difference when you do something out of a heart of gratitude rather than out of expecting something from him. I mean, regardless, we are to expect from him. But when I say expect, I mean, if I, um, how can I say it? I'm, I'm going to use YouTube as an example because a lot of people use YouTube <laughs> because they want to earn money and fame and all that. So when people make Christian content on YouTube, they shouldn't expect fame or they shouldn't expect a paycheck. You should be doing it out of the gratitude of your heart to glorify God. What you do should glorify God and not yourself. So for me, I know when I make these videos, I don't make them for me because um, I don't personally like to be in the forefront of anything. <laughs> I'm more of a stay behind the scenes kind of person. But when I do these things, I definitely do it for the glory of God. It's not for me. It's not for people to say, oh, my God, you're so smart or, you know, feel bad or anything like that. Everything that I do, especially on my um, Christian channel, is not for me. It is for God. I love sharing the word of God um, because I'm just so grateful and thankful for everything he's done for me. So what you do and how you live should always show your thankfulness and your gratitude to God. Um. Let's go on to verse 2, where he says, Bearing with one another in love. I'm going to need to get paper. And I really don't feel like getting it. So give me one quick second to go grab some paper, because I have a lot of notes to write. So I got the paper, but I haven't cut it down yet. I have to cut it down to size and I don't feel like doing that so I'm just going to use this notepad and glue the notepad paper inside of the um, Bible. Is this going to fit actually? Yes it will. Okay. So we're going to be improvising today with that. Let me move these out of the way. Stick it here. Alright. So bearing with one another in love. Um, Basically, wrongs that occur between people and God's family will not work against his purpose of bringing all things together in Jesus because love covers all. And basically, it's just a reminder that no matter how angry I am with somebody, no matter how upset I am with somebody, no matter what somebody has done to me, no matter how bad someone has hurt me, God's purpose will always come to fruition. Like, it does not matter. And we know that... Um, his purpose is to bring all things together um, in Jesus. So it, it really doesn't matter. I just need to show love and um, give love and give love without reservation. And that is very hard to do. I'm not going to lie. It's very hard, um, especially when somebody has hurt you to love them regardless of the hurt or love them through the hurt. That is like the hardest thing to do. But um, this is just telling me that no matter what, I need to one, be humble um, so I need to have a lowliness of mind. I need to be modest. I need to have consideration. Um, and I also have to 
have slowness in avenging my wrong and in avenging wrongs um and be long suffering and deal with that and do it all in love um everything that god is is god is love basically so um you know love covers all and we need to remember that but again like i said it, it can be a very hard thing to do and think about so verse what's this verse two we are going to put this up here So verse two, love covers all, nothing, will work against God bringing all things together in Jesus so then verse 3 he says uh, maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace Basically, with an attitude of humility and forgiveness, it naturally fulfills peace between us as God desired. Um, spiritual unity is key and is the responsibility of each believer. We are to pursue it earnestly. And again, peace is another one of those things where it's just like, you hurt me, we can't be peaceable, we can't be friends. But when it comes to love, you need forgiveness, you need humility, and you also need to... Um, be able to be peaceable between one another so for that i am going to write spiritual unity is key and the responsibility and I'm putting the focus more so on believers because believers understand and know God. Unbelievers don't know God, so they're not going to always understand um, right from wrong. Now, don't get me wrong, everyone knows when things are wrong and when things are right. But um, with the standard that God has given, not all men, and when I say men, I mean like everyone, woman and female. I mean females and men, but um, not everyone is going to understand the standard that god has given us people live by the way of the world um we are born into a world of sin so they're not going to fully understand their responsibility that god has given them if they're not believers we as believers understand that and we are to uphold that standard and sometimes we get lost in it i know for me in high school and college i completely lost my sight lost my way and i did things the way the world did things and um it was not good because I could have been a light in the darkness that my friends were in and instead I engaged in the darkness and ended up in darkness myself. So um, we as believers have a very crucial responsibility to understand spiritual unity is key, understand that love covers all and to understand that we need to be peaceable between everyone, whether they are a friend or a foe. So. Um, so spiritual unity is key in the responsibility of each believer. Pursue it. Earnestly. All right. Um, moving along to four, it says there is one body and one spirit. So basically it's saying that we all have the same Holy Spirit and we are all one as the church and the church is the body of Christ. So one body and one spirit. And this is also a reminder that there is nothing now separating the Jews from the Gentiles. It's not just the Jews who get the Holy Spirit, but it's everyone who um, believes 
that gets the Holy Spirit. So we all have all have the same Holy Spirit. My Holy Spirit is not different from your Holy Spirit. Um, and it doesn't matter if you speak in tongues or not. Because I know that's another thing where people be like, oh, well, my Holy Spirit is more sanctified and holier than yours because I can speak in tongues. And um, just because you can speak in tongues doesn't mean anything. Tongues is technically Hebrew. Um, so, you know, you're speaking in... And when I say it's technically Hebrew, <laughs> I'm going to have to make a whole other video on that. Because I know somebody's going to comment and probably say something weird on YouTube. So, yeah, I'm going to just leave it at that. Um, so, we all have the same Holy Spirit. All one as the church. Which is the body of Christ. And the cross reference for that is Romans 12 and 5. And then the rest of it says, uh, You were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. So basically, we all have the same call, um, which gives us the same hope. And again, this is not to say that your dream is the same as my dream. My goal is the same as your goal. But that one ultimate goal should bring, um, should be to bring people to Christ, to help save souls, to help save lives, um, and to expand the kingdom of God. That should be everyone's ultimate goal. So when he's talking about the call, he's not meaning like your individual call, whether it be to teach or to preach or to work as a doctor or to, you know, minister or go on missions or whatever the case. No, he's talking about the ultimate call. Um, so. I'm going to actually underline it. You were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. all have same call giving us the same hope let me actually turn off this heater for a minute because I don't know if it's humming Going on to verse 7, because I don't have anything for... I mean, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, we all understand that. Um, there is only one God. There is only one Christ. There is only one faith. Um, no matter what anybody says, we should all have the same faith. Um, and I don't mean level of faith. I just mean faith in general. And one baptism, I mean by the water, with the water and the Holy Spirit, that's, that's baptism. Um, one God and Father of all, again, that one God, one Father of all is God, the true in God, um, the creator of all, the source of all, he is everything, so, I mean, that's pretty much standard, which is why I didn't write anything for verses 5 and 6, because it's, it's standard. Um, so then verse 7, he says, grace was given to each one of us. Grace was given to each one of us. Which means that we all have received the same grace. Saving grace, which then also turns into sustaining grace. So if you're an unbeliever becoming a believer, you now have saving grace. And when you are a believer and you're going through your Christian walk, you're um, stumbling, you're having a hard time, you have sustaining grace. So regardless, at the end of the day, we all have grace. Um, and it's the same grace given to us. And no one's grace is better than the next. So... Verse 7. All received. The same grace. Saving grace becomes sustaining grace. That is not how you spell sustaining, but whatever. We're just going to keep going. So again, um, verse 7 says grace was given to each of us. 
to each one of us. So again, we all get the same grace. Um, again, no one's grace is better than the next. My grandmother's, my great, great, great grandmother's grace is not different from my grace because she also had the same grace. When she was an unbeliever and she became a believer, she received saving grace. And in her walk as a Christian, um, she then had sustaining grace. So that's just a great reminder to just let us all know that grace is given to everyone. And no one is left out of that um, if they're believers. And even unbelievers get grace from God. I mean, honestly, if you think about it, they get grace from God as well. So, um, good morning, Tanya. So, moving on, it says, according to the measure of Christ's gift. So, grace was a gift that we did not deserve. Um, and it was through grace that we received our spiritual gifts. So, it, I mean, it, it, it's a gift. It's a gift from God that, that we don't deserve. Um, none of us deserve grace. None of us deserve mercy. None of us deserve peace. Like, none of us deserve any of that if we really look at the track list that each of us individually have. But um, because of what Christ did for us, it was now gifted to us. And because of that grace, we now have spiritual gifts. So, um... This is still verse 7, yes. Grace was an undeserved gift. And then it says, uh, therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. So this is basically evidence of Christ's triumph over every foe. Um, I mean, it is what it is. And the captives would be those, um, if you will, unbelievers in a sense. Um, the children who know the light but got lost uh, and things like that. So this, if I'm not mistaken, it comes from Psalms 18 and 18. So I'm just going to write Psalms. I'm sorry, not 18. Psalms 68 and 18. That's what I'm going to write. That's where this comes from. So there's that. So let me add all of the color that I want to add now. Mm. Alrighty, um, I think this is a part that I don't like because then I feel like I have to be quiet while I'm doing this when I really don't. But this is four. to see something because I feel like I made a mistake just now <laughs> I did that should actually all be one highlight
and one more color. One more to go. Alright, so now we're going to move on to verses 9 to 16. Yeah. Don't need that to fall. So, 9 to 16. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Verse 16, from which, I'm sorry, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So, going to the words for definition, we're going to go with equip, which is in verse 12. Mature, which is in verse 13. I think those are the only two, one, two in this. Yeah. So, equip and mature. So, I'm going to use this color for equip. And this green for mature. And equip in the Greek is this word. And it means bringing to a condition of fitness. And mature, here's the Greek word for that. But it means spe specially of completeness of Christian character. So again, I'm just going to highlight. We'll match these colors rather. Move that out of my way. All right, so going back, starting with verse 9. It says, He also, I'm sorry, that He ascended. But that he had also descended. So basically you can see this two ways. As in Christ coming to earth and going back to heaven. Or that um, he died, resurrected, and defeated hell and Satan's work. Which then allowed him to ascend back into heaven. So you can kind of see it both in a spiritual manner as well as in like a fleshly manner. Um, it really just depends on how you grasp the Im information so he came to earth died resurrected I don't know why I put two S's but resurrected And defeated Satan. So again, this is a twofold. You can see it either way. I see it more so of him dying, being resurrected, and defeating Satan. Um, going on to verse 10, 
It says, He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So basically, Christ had to die so that he could resurrect to fulfill the prophecies told. Um, there were prophecies told about him in the Old Testament by the prophets. And in order for those things to come to fruition, he had to die. Um, and let's be real, he honestly didn't have to die. I mean, Christ didn't have to do anything he didn't want to do. But he willingly died to fulfill the prophecies, to fulfill the scriptures from the Old Testament and the scrolls and things like that. So um, I just think that's a great reminder. I'm not going to write that down, but you guys can. Um, I do have it in the notes, though. So moving on to verse 11. It says that he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. So with that, um, this is, in a sense, Jesus establishing the fivefold ministry. Um, and that they were... I'm sorry, they are the work and appointment of Jesus and not men. Um, these are the these are divine institutions and they're not man-made. Um, so these were things that man didn't create. And I think that's something that a lot of preachers and prophets and apostles tend to forget. Um, they did not make this work. Jesus gave it to them. God gave it to them. It was something that God... Um, you know, ordained for them to be able to obtain. And um, apostles are basically ambassadors of God's work. Prophets speak forth, speaks forth God's word in complete consistency with the foundation of his word. Evangelists are gifted to preach the good news of salvation in Christ. Um, the shepherds, which are basically pastors, they basically um, look over and watch over the flock of God, which are basically the people that uh, would go to their church. And the teachers teach the word of God. So people tend to forget that, you know, just because you're a prophet or a pastor or a minister or an evangelist or a deacon or whatever, they feel like they got themselves there. And that's never the case. These are not things that were made by man. These were divine institutions that were um, the appointment and the work of Christ and the work of God, not of man. So I'm not going to underline that, but you can always just write that down. Um, what I just said. Good morning, Rosalind. Rosalind or is it Rosalind? Hi, Angela. Um, so, yeah. Moving on to verse 12. Actually, you know what? I'm going to actually go back. Verse 11. I'm actually going to write something down. I'm sorry. Verse yeah, verse 11. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. And I'm just going to write a short note. Um, Jesus, my stomach is going off. I need to eat. I'm so happy, you guys. We finished the fast yesterday. My church was on a 21-day fast, but we didn't start until the 2nd. And I can finally eat. I can have coffee. I can just enjoy life. Rosalind. Is that how you say it? <laughs> Rosalind. But um, yeah, I can finally have coffee again. So I'm drinking coffee right now. And this is completely a side note. But um... You guys know on my YouTube channel, I rave about the pumpkin spice creamer from, Inter I think it's International Delights or whatever. I don't know the company name, but I've been raving about that creamer because it tastes so good inside of the Bigelow pumpkin spice tea, but I can't seem to find it anywhere. So I had my mother running around <laughs> on, was it Saturday? What day was that? I think it was su Sunday. Was it Sunday? Oh my God. No, Monday. Sorry. Monday. I had her running around. Because I was really on a hunt for this pumpkin spice creamer. And my Walmart is supposed to sell it, but they don't have any in stock. And the one place that did have it didn't want to sell it to me. So I went to ShopRite and they had all the other flavors. Like uh, they had Oreo. They had raspberry. They had some weird stuff. But I ended up snagging the white chocolate macadamia nut one. And the Cold Stone Sweet Cream Creamer. Those things are so delicious. So good. I'm really a fan of the sweet cream cold stone one. It tastes like ice cream. So that is like one of my new favorite ones outside of French vanilla. I know that was totally like left field. I don't know why I just mentioned that. But yeah, my stomach might growl. I apologize. <laughs> I'm going to eat after this video. But um, yeah, if you guys have any creamers that I should try on my coffees, let me know so random like i said but i know anyway jesus established 
uh, the fivefold ministry. They, can you see this? Okay, let me move over. They are the work and appointments of him, not man. And um, I just, I feel like a lot of, this, this is probably why a lot of apostles and prophets are starting to be um, revealed as false prophets, if you will. Not not even false prophets. Let me not even say that because a lot of them are not false prophets. But um, they're being called out because they feel like what they do is all about them. And again, we are not supposed to do anything to glorify ourselves. I mean, I said that back in, I believe, verse 1 where it says, Urge you to walk in a manner worthy of um, the calling which you have been called. It's not about you. You do the things that you do to serve God, to glorify God, to obey him. And you do it out of a heart of gratitude. It should never be about you because when it becomes about you, that's when God is like, no, and he tries to get your attention. And if you don't get it the first time, he'll make sure you get his attention one way or the other. And um, yeah, you don't want to make him mad. So I just think it's important to understand that the fivefold ministry was something that God and Jesus created um, and established for the work of them and not for us, if that makes sense. But um, as I'm doing this, let me do my markings because I don't need to be stressing out. Oh, and I do have a book haul coming on the channel because I got some new Christian fiction books, biblical fiction, if you will, and I'm excited to share it, but I'm waiting on the package and I was hoping it would come today. So I don't know. Hopefully it will be here before I leave for this retreat, which I'm actually excited about this retreat too, but I hate this lavender color because it never works properly for me. Oh, and I do have some giveaways coming because I just got a package from a company that I work with of Bible studies. So I have giveaways coming. I think I want to do two giveaways in February. I know this is like totally, totally random. You guys know how I am with the random comments. But yeah, I'm thinking about doing two giveaways, probably three or four. I don't know. I know I want to do one definitely in February for Valentine's Day, but I think I'm going to do that more of like for those mommies out there because I am a mommy myself. And um, my son loves Bible study. He likes to read the Bible. He likes to do things. And every time I purchase things or get things, I make sure that I buy double for backup. So I'm probably going to have a few giveaways coming. I'll probably do one at the end of the month. Mm, end of the month is next week. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do probably two or three in February. Um, definitely one on my YouTube channel and stuff. Because I still have a bunch of the Kling books just sitting in my house. Like, I have over 20 copies of Kling because I love cling so much and I need to get rid of them because they're taking up so much space. It's ridiculous. Side note, but anyway, moving on to verse 12. <laughs> so moving on to verse 12, um, it says to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ. So basically these gifts, which are basically the fivefold ministry that was mentioned with the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, those those gifts of leadership were given to prepare God's people to serve and expand and, ex and strengthen the body of Christ. Um, so basically this is saying that those in these five roles are meant to lead and serve. And I think that's where a lot of leaders get confused is that they feel that they don't have to serve. Oh my God, Stacy! you have to read it. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. It's such a good book. That was so left. I'm sorry. <sighs> Kling has like a special place in my heart along with Fervent. Um, yeah, I'm going to send you a message, Stacey, because you, you, we got to get you a copy of that because it, it's amazing. But um, yeah, so a lot of leaders tend to forget that just because you lead doesn't mean that you don't serve. And I think that's one, th one of the reasons why I absolutely love my my um church leaders right now my bishop and my pastor because they understand that even though they're leaders they are to still serve the people 
yeah, I will send you, I'm going to send you and, um, Stacey a message right when I'm done with this, uh, video session, okay? Because I, first of all, I need to get rid of these books, like, they're just sitting here, like, just, they need to go, um, but I also love them, so I'm like, I don't want to let them go, but I love them, and I already have two copies that I've annotated, so I just need to get rid of them before I reread every one of these and annotate them, but yeah, um, <laughs> verse 12, leaders tend to forget that they're meant to serve, just because you lead doesn't mean anything, Jesus came to lead, but in his leading, he also served his people, I mean, he, he washed the feet of his disciples before he was crucified, I mean, so I think that's something, again, leaders tend to forget. Just because you are a leader doesn't mean that you don't serve your people. You serve them to teach them to lead. Um, and that's really the purpose of it. So to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of Christ. So again, I'm going to write that note here. This is verse 12. So... Gifts of leadership given to prepare his people to serve. And serve, again, is like the first word because that's basically what we're to do. We're not even to serve ourselves. We're to serve other people <laughs> like it tells us that in the Bible in so many different ways, but um, because it doesn't always use the word serve, people tend to forget that serv serving another person is um, essential in the walk. So um, his people to serve, expand, and strengthen. the body of Christ and the body of Christ is the church um, and the church does not mean the church building your body is the church <laughs> and I think that's another thing that people tend to forget is that just because you have a building and you call it a church that does not mean that is the church that he is speaking of the church is the people the body the key word being body um so yeah the body of Christ and I think you know a lot of people a lot of churches really need to um start truly teaching scripture and breaking it down because a lot I know for me when I went to my first church I didn't fully understand scripture and um it wasn't that they weren't teaching it because they were teaching it to the adults but I feel like in youth church or um anything that has to do with kids they tend to lose sight that kids need to understand the word of God I wish that back in my old church, we did more than just watch VeggieTales. Because, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love VeggieTales. My son loves it now. I still watch VeggieTales with him. But it's some things that when it comes to scripture, they I feel like they need to teach kids. And it's really not hard to teach it. It's just a matter of you being able to connect with people to teach the word. And I feel like when you hear church as a child, I was like, I don't have to go to church. I mean, I know what the Bible says, but I don't want to go to church. And um, everything was church, church, church. And church to me was the church building. And instead of me realizing that I am the church, I am the body of Christ, like, I needed to think like that. I think that was part of the um, another thing that, like, I lost because I was always thinking about the church building. So I was just doing me and then went to the church building on Sundays, praising the Lord, hallelujah, and then doing what I wanted to do the rest of the week. So I think that's something else people need to start learning in the church, but who knows? Um, so again, gifts of leadership given to prepare his people to serve, expand, and strengthen the body of Christ. And I want to say those who lead are to serve okay so moving on 13 so it says until we attain the unity of the faith so the goal of god's work through the offices and the equipping is spiritual unity this is not about an organizational unity and it's not about a structural unity and again this goes back to the whole idea of the church being a building and the church being an organization yes that's all great you can have a nice church you can have a nice organization that's great but it's more so about 
your faith being unified and when i say unified i don't mean that y'all like everybody's faith has to be on the same level because no everybody's not going to have the same faith i'm not the same faith but everybody's faith is not going to be on the same level some people might have a stronger faith than other people and that's totally fine but that's where the whole unity of faith comes in because you still need to be on one accord with that faith um one person can't say i have uh, i need an example i don't even know what to think um okay so say if a pastor i guess uh he's working on I, i'm gonna use a church building as an example whatever um he wants to get a new church building because it's needed right so Half the church can't have faith that they're going to get the new bills and then the other half can't not have faith because in there, there's two different faiths going against each other. Um, the faith needs to be the same. Yes, we are going to get this church building. We have faith in this. Now, whether your faith is higher than the next or lower than the next, that doesn't matter. You can have the faith the size of a must see and it can move mountains. So as long as you are all on one accord with your faith, where your faith is going, it's going in one direction, that's fine. But your faith cannot be going in 20,000 different directions. This person believes this and this person got faith for this and this person got faith for that. The church is meant to be unified. The body of Christ is meant to be unified, be it in love, be it in peace, be it in faith. So, um, unity of the faith is basically saying that the goal of God's work through those offices, which the offices are the fivefold ministry, um, and the equipping of the saints is spiritual unity. So, I'm just going to say goal is spiritual unity. by way of faith then it says of the knowledge of the son of god so our understanding of christ will increase and we will have greater intimacy that will be experienced with that unity of faith um so do I want to write that down? No, I don't. But you, again, you can say, you can write that down. So basically it says the knowledge of the Son of God. Basically the understanding of Christ will increase and that there will be a greater intimacy to be experienced. Then it says to mature manhood. So I do want to underline that one. So to mature manhood, this is basically saying that the gifts are to mature ourselves, which then it matures the body of Christ. Um, and again, it's not about you, but in order for you to use your gifts, you yourself need to be matured. You cannot lead a church when you are immature. In my church right now, before we go on our minister's retreat, we're reading a book that um, the, pa the youth pastor slash pastor of administration has us reading. And it's called The Emotionally... <sighs> Where's my note? Because <laughs> I can't remember. I'm going to actually... Do I? I don't even think I have it on my thing yet. Oh, Lord. Let me check real quick before I even do that. If not, I'm going to have to pull it up. Um, no, but I think it's called The Emotionally Healthy Leader by Peter S Gazzaro or Skezaro, I can't pronounce that name. I'll mention it. I'll post a link to it in the group later. But um, that book right there, um, it really talks about how we ourselves need to mature um, in Christ before we can truly lead and serve people. So it can be complicated to really understand because one, you're not supposed to just, you know, serve yourself and lead um, without serving but at the same time you still need to serve yourself but then the thing is that people get caught up in serving themselves and doing for the for themselves and um seeking recognition for themselves that they don't move past that and the gifts that god gives you is for yourself but more so for you to be able to help the body um so yes you are supposed to mature yourself <laughs> you are supposed to um, recognize certain things within yourself but you aren't supposed to take that and just run with it and again that goes back to all of these like famous pastors and prophets and stuff like that they take this stuff and they run with it they they run with it they they get caught up in themselves and um that's not what you're supposed to do you're not supposed to get caught up in yourself you take it you learn for yourself so that you can therefore then go and teach someone and help someone um and the only person i can think of right now is 
pastor or I think his name is Pastor Dietrich Haddon. I don't know if he's a pastor. Can't remember. But Dietrich Haddon. Um, I used to love that man's music. Um, because he was very much gifted in the Word of God. At least in my opinion, he was. You guys might feel the same. Um, or differently. I don't know if any of you know about Dietrich Haddon, but I feel like he messed up by getting on that pastor show. They had a show with a bunch of pastors in L.A. He went on that show, and I feel like he lost sight of himself because he allowed these people to, um, in a sense, dictate who he was, especially with the whole shocking up thing with his fiance girlfriend at the time, whatever the case may be. But I feel like he's completely like lost himself um, because he was trying to make everything about him. And now he's out here. He went from making gospel music to making um, what he calls baby making music and I, I don't know. It's just something about it. I can't listen to his music anymore because I feel like um, he still has a lot of growing to do. And it might not make sense what I'm saying to you guys. But to me, it makes sense because my mother and a lot of other people that I've communicated with that actually listen to his music feel the same way. Um, a lot of these well-known pastors and stuff, they're out here doing things that they shouldn't do. I think that there's another pastor who apparently cheated on his wife and um, he his wife blamed the devil and all this craziness. Like, I don't know. I feel like when you glorify yourself, God will do something to make you realize you're, you're doing something wrong. Um, and whether that be in the privacy of your own home or out in public, it, it's just a reminder that you need to be mature and not just mature for yourself, but mature for the body of Christ because your maturity level helps to expand and extend and strengthen the body of Christ. When you are not mature, you are now hurting not just yourself, but the entire body of Christ, which is also a reminder that, um, whatever you do, whatever you say, however you act, it doesn't just affect you and it doesn't just affect the people who are around you or who know you. It affects the entire body of Christ. So that was just a whole tangent, but I just had to say that. So, um, but this is still verse 13. So what time is it? It is 1104. Yep. This is going to be a long session because there are 32 verses. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to say gifts are to mature self and quick note for anybody who already purchased the um ephesians bible study notes i do have to go back and edit some stuff so once i update it i will be sending it out to those who did purchase the notes so if you purchase these notes and you have them printed out i am going to be sending an updated version because i'm finding a lot of errors <laughs> in this so i'm going to update it and then send it to you guys okay just wanted to let you guys know because i'm looking at this now and i'm like there's so many mistakes that i didn't see originally so in the body of Christ all right um hopefully when I edit this video I'll probably edit out most of it so it's not too long for YouTube <laughs> um and then the last part for 13 it says to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so um basically we are to grow old and mature in Christ as individuals and as a corporate body um before you can help someone you yourself need to be mature and um in who Christ is and after you do that, you then go and help the body of Christ. And the cross-reference for that is going to be Colossians 1 and 19. I'm not going to write that out, but it's there for you guys. So, moving on to verse 14. So, it says, No longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine. So, the gifts and the equipping, the gifts being the fivefold ministry, I'm sorry, guys. I'm just looking at the uh, comments. Hold on. Yeah, Tanya. Dietrich Haddon is like, uh, he's he's losing his mind. I don't want to say that. No, I'm not going to say that. That was not very nice for me to say. But um, not that he's losing his mind. I feel like he's just getting lost in the whole fame and living in L.A. And I feel like being on that show really messed him up. He should not personally have gone on that show. That's honestly what I believe. Him being on that show completely messed him up. Rosalind, um, on my blog, uh, daughterofincrease.blogspot.com, I have a section called Shop. Um, I think that's what it says. I don't even remember. <laughs> Let me actually pull up the website. Hold on. I know the link is like shop, but it's on my blog. I also have free print printables that I'm working on. I'm hoping to release that in February. 
probably not till March though. Sorry about that. I just hit the phone. But um let me pull it up on the blog so I remember what <laughs> what tab it is. Um yeah, so if you go to my blog daughter of increase dot block spot dot com, there is a tab at the top that says shop and that's where you can find um the notes for Ephesians as well as Jonah um and James should be up there hopefully within two weeks. <laughs> but um Yes, Tanya, that's his name, John Gray. Yeah, the whole thing with him cheating on his wife and then taking the church funds to buy uh, buy cars or whatever. I don't I don't know. I feel like a lot of these famous pastors, they lose sight um of God. They lose sight of themselves and their walk and they get caught up in the fame and all of that stuff. I feel like it's okay to be you're welcome. But um I feel like it's okay to be in the you know, in the light. Um, in the limelight, if you will, but you should always have a brighter light that you're looking at, which is the light of God, the light of Christ. Um, and because a lot of them get caught up in the limelight, they lose sight and it can be downhill for them. So yeah, a lot of these pastors, I'm, I feel bad for, I know that there's a prophet, um, that I actually recently heard about on YouTube. I don't know. They call him the Michael Jackson lookalike. Some people call him Jesus in the flesh. I don't forgot his name. Um, and I listened to one of his videos and I'm not going to lie. I was creeped out. So I had to stop because I didn't feel right. I like it felt wrong. I don't know this man's name. Um, let me, like I said, we go on a tangent. Um, for those who are watching this on YouTube, this is what we do. So if you ever want to watch these live sessions, um, live from the Facebook group, you can, but, um, I need to look up this passage, this, this prophet's name. Hold on. They call him Jesus in the flesh. Literally, that's what people call him. I think he's from ATL or something like that. Ah. Um, uh, Prophet. I don't forgot this name. This man's name. They call him. Okay, so his name was Prophet Joshua Holmes. Um, and he does a lot of flashiness. He's from Texas, not Atlanta. Okay, so he's a Texas. Um prophet and i watched some of his stuff and that man is very much flashy um he dances on top of people who throw money at him and i mean like they throw money on like the pulpit and he starts dancing and shouting on the money yeah this this prophet here um he a little different and they literally there are people on youtube who call him jesus in the flesh and it's crazy that people really um allow it to happen and now don't get me wrong this this prophet joshua holmes he is gifted i'm not gonna lie he's very gifted but that's another example of you taking your gift and um trying to exalt yourself um instead of him correcting people he just lets people say what they want to say and a lot of these women out here are very attracted to him and i just think it's insane like it's it's really insane that you know we are literally in the end times the in the last days and things are being revealed yeah, Tanya, his name is Prophet um, Joshua Holmes. You can look him up on YouTube. And um, he really can, you know, speak the word of God. But he just does too much for me. Like, yeah, that's, yes, definitely, Stacey, yeah. Like, and he doesn't correct people, um, like, at all. Like, he doesn't correct them. He doesn't tell them to not call him Jesus in the flesh. There are people who literally call him Jesus in the flesh who believe that he is Jesus. And it's it's so terrible like i watched one like i said i tried to watch one of his videos because he has a youtube channel where he does um some teachings and my spirit just didn't feel right mm -mm. and i'm not gonna like again like i said he can speak the word of god but my spirit ain't connecting with his spirit because i just first of all you letting people call you jesus in the flesh like just no jesus has not come back yet <laughs> There are some people who believe Jesus is here. There are some people who don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. I don't know. But, you know, it, the world, the world we live in, that's all I can say. Yeah, it's, it's bad because you don't know where to turn um, to go to the word of God for. Like, that didn't make any sense what I just said. But you don't know who to go to to get help or to fully understand the word of God because you have a lot of these people um and majority of the times it's people who really do know the word of God and who can teach the word of God but again they get caught up in all the fame and the flash and all of that social media has just ruined life <laughs> for people just period 
Um, and that's why when I look on YouTube, I really try to find people that are um, who are gifted in the word of God, but also understand how to still be themselves without getting caught up in the you know the whole fame and fortune thing like i'm gonna do a video on my youtube channel with um some of my personal favorite pastors and personal favorite youtubers who speak the word of god but still live for like they still do the things that they i don't know how how to say it they 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 speak the word of god but they also understand who they are and don't get caught up in the social media aspects of life or the craziness of life i hope that makes sense but i'm gonna have that coming to my channel soon because it's it's bad <laughs> it's really bad but um 14 like i said so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine so again um the gifts that were mentioned back in verse 11 that and then the whole equipping of the saints that mentioned in verse 12 um should always result in stability we should be firmly planted on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Um, we should not be easily led astray. And unfortunately, it does happen. And I know for me, I was completely led astray again back in high school and college because those were the times where I completely just allowed myself to be surrounded by darkness. Um, and it wasn't that I wasn't um, taught well because, my, like I said, my church that I originally went to before back in middle school and stuff, um, they taught the word of God very well. But as a kid, we didn't fully understand the word of God. And all we got was veggie tales. Like, that's literally on Sundays, they did veggie tales. We read some Psalms. Um, you know, we did little mini Bible studies, but nothing too in-depth. So from all the things that I experienced through the testimony series that I, I mentioned, um, you know, I started to lose that stability because I wasn't firmly planted on the foundation of the word of God. And when you do um, get caught up in the world and you're not firmly planted, it allows you to be led astray. Now, nowadays, I'm too firmly planted in the word of God. Like if you say something to me and it does not align, like my spirit can pick it up immediately and I have to either just move on, cut you off, or whatever the case may be, because I refuse to be led astray. I know what it feels like to be led astray. I know what it feels like to be in darkness. I know, and it sucks, and I don't ever want to go back to that. So I am stable. Like, I stay in the Word of God. And I'm not going to say that I don't have moments where I feel like I'm slipping, because I've had a few of those moments, Um, you know, with everything going on in my family now. it You know, I feel it creeping. But the one thing I don't do is allow it to pull me away. I pull closer to God instead of running away. And um, that's basically what verse 14 is saying is that we should find stability through the gifts, which is a fivefold ministry, and through people who are supposed to be equipping you. If you're not being equipped correctly to be stable and to be firmly planted, you need to really rethink that because wherever you're going, whatever church you're at, you need to be able to be firmly planted in that word. And if that church is not helping you to be firmly planted and rooted and stable, you should question <laughs> whether one if you're getting the right teaching or two if it's you and you need to just be opened up to the word of god so it can definitely be a twofold thing whether it's um you yourself or it's the teachings you're getting so yeah yeah the discerning spirit i'm still definitely learning about that myself um i know now like when i'm around certain people or i hear certain things my spirit wakes up like, no, 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 that's not okay. <laughs> you know, I haven't listened. I don't listen to hip hop like I used to. Um, I did a little fast, like a personal fast. I think it was last year where I was like, I'm not going to listen to hip hop for like a month. And now I can listen, like I can listen to hip hop and stuff like that. But it comes to a point after time, my ears start to buzz. Like they literally <laughs> start to buzz. And that just means time is up. No more of that music. Um, Because a lot of the music nowadays is all about sex and all that. And that's stuff that I'm trying to stay away from personally. So like I can listen to a few songs here and there. But if I go too long listening to music, my ears will buzz. So I find that I listen to a lot more gospel music than ever. Like gospel music makes me happy which is weird because I, I grew up as a dancer doing ballet hip-hop jazz and all that um so i love my afro pop my afro beat i love my hip-hop music i enjoy i'm not gonna lie i enjoy listening to cardi b every you know every now and then but i my spirit does not allow me to fully listen to it for long periods of time and i know it's gonna come to a point where i can no longer 
listen to hip hop because that's honestly where I I feel God pulling me is to completely draw away from the whole hip hop R and B music because that type of music is very much drowned in um a lot of spirits that I don't need in my life. So I know that's where it's going, but like right now I can listen to a few songs for maybe like twenty five minutes if that and then my ear starts buzzing and I know that that's a like that's a uh a note for me to stop listening to it. So I'm going to underline this no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine and again gifting and equipping are you guys seeing this somebody is calling my phone and i don't know who it is and i'm not gonna answer so i hope they leave a voicemail because that's not in my phone book gifting and equipping should result in stability and firm planting on the word and um I believe it's, I had a cross open let me see if I can find it Yeah, the cross reference for verse uh, 14 in chapter 4 is going to be Ephesians 2 and 20, which just says, um, built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. So, um, yeah, I'm going to put Ephesians 2, 20, which just talks about the whole uh, foundation being that that the apostles and the prophets taught, which were basically the words of God. Um, and again, the apostles and prophets of that time, but in our case, it would be our pastors, our bishops, um, whoever is the head of your church. Awesome, Tanya. Yeah, it's very hard to find a good, um, a good home church, um, with a good leader that's teaching and serving <laughs> and, um, understanding of the word of God, um. Yeah. See, I don't know. I guess I grew up listening to that type of music because my dad is a, um, a DJ and a musician. And then both of my brothers, literally both of my brothers are following my dad's footsteps with the whole music career. So um, one of my brothers, uh, well, the oldest of my younger brothers, because I'm the oldest of all of us, but I'm the oldest of my younger brothers. He uh, he plays drums. He plays the bass. He plays the piano. He produces um, music and stuff like that. And you know, he's had the opportunity to travel. He's recently done stuff with Tanache. He's going to be working with Mario, I think Chris Brown. Um, you know, he, he's had a lot of opportunity to do that. So we have grew up around music. My father used to play as a DJ in a club. Um, and then my other brother, who's like the second youngest, if you will, the second youngest brother, if that makes sense, because <laughs> I have three younger brothers. Um, so the second youngest brother, he's a uh, organist and a pianist. And he's starting, you know, to um, get more heavily into the music world because he's about to be 18. So, like, we, we grew up around music. So listening to that type of stuff never really bothered me. Or at least I didn't realize that it was affecting me <laughs> in the way that it was because it just was what I grew up around. And then when you get to middle school and high school and you, you're on dance teams and stuff, that's just stuff that you dance to. So it didn't really, I didn't really see anything with it bothering me up until, you know, I got into my late 20s and, um, I just got sick of being in the depressed state that I was in and I got out of it and I started doing stuff to change. That's when I started realizing how much music can really affect you. Um, and, you know, when people say music affects you, you don't really think about it. Um, but, yeah, it, it affects you more than just on an emotional level. It affects you on a spiritual level. Like, it really does. If I listen to Chris Brown or Neo or even Trey songs for too long, my body starts to react to it. And not in a good way. So I know for a fact that music is just... <sighs> but then again, if I'm not mistaken, um, the enemy. Uh, Satan was... Uh, I think he was over music. If I'm not mistaken. I feel like that's that's right. But I might be mistaken. But I feel like <laughs> he was um, the angel of music in heaven. If I recall from what I remember. If I'm wrong, somebody correct that for me. 
but yeah and that's another thing like music was definitely music back in the day um you know it was very much still sexual music but it wasn't over the top sexual as it is now you know it was very much um relational music like people were in relationships when they were singing these songs now it's just like you know people just saying what they want to say how they want to say it doing with but yeah it's it it's a lot it's a lot i know there's one song and again i apologize if you're watching this on youtube and i'm going on a tangent <laughs> but um there's one song and this i think the song is called timmy turner and that song is a very creepy song but what gets me about the song is i used to love um timmy turner from um what's the bag on show he had a little fairly, fairly, fairly odd parents is what the show is called. Um, so when I heard the song, I was like, oh, my God, they took, you know, the kids show the fairly odd parents and they took the character Timmy Turner and made a song. But when you listen to the song, it's very demonic. Um, the person is rapping about giving their souls to the devil. They're like they're literally rapping about this stuff, um, how their soul is in a furnace. And it took me some time to fully listen to the words because I used to love listening to the music just for the beats because my dad and my brothers, they're musicians. So they, you know, they make beats. So beats make me happy for some reason. So I would just listen to the music, not for the lyrics, for the music itself, for the instrumental parts. And I remember one day the Lord was like, listen to the spirit, listen to the, the lyrics. And I listened to the lyrics and I, from to this day, I can never listen to that song again just because of the lyrics. I don't know why you would rap about giving your soul to the devil and it being in a furnace. Like he, uh, yeah, the lyrics, lyrics. Yeah, that's another thing people need to pay attention to are the lyrics because the instrumentals and the beats are what grasp your attention. And when you're not paying attention to the lyrics themselves, the lyrics are now speaking into your ear gates and um, basically, in a sense, ministering to you, which is terrible. Yeah, like Timmy, um, the Fairly Odd Parents is a really good cartoon, but there was a rapper, I can't remember which, what the rapper's name was, but he made a song based off of, he called it Timmy Turner, and it had nothing to do with the actual show. It was just, I was attracted to the song because I was like, oh my God, I like the Fairly Odd Parents, but when I listened to the song, I was just like, what? It, it's, yeah, um, it's, yeah, that's all I can say, that song is ridiculous, but, um, the Fairly Odd Parents as a TV show is really awesome, I love it. But when you when people take innocent, he basically took an innocent show and um, named the song after this very innocent character and completely just freaked me out <laughs> when the Lord told me to listen to the lyrics. So, yeah. So, again, for verse 14, gifting and equipping should result in stability and firm planting on the word. And the cross reference for that is going to be Ephesians 2 and 20. Um, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna have a few like I have a whole bunch of like video ideas in my mind to do I just get caught up on like when to make these videos because my house ain't always quiet It's quiet now because my brothers both my brothers are sleeping So that's why I was like, let me get in some video time <laughs> But yeah, um, I'm definitely gonna do a whole video on like music and stuff on my channel soon But uh, okay So moving on to 15 it says rather speaking the truth in love and oh my god this is something that i feel like <laughs> people need to work on is speaking truth in love because we always want to you know tell somebody the truth but one thing i notice is that it's not really so much the truth that they don't want to hear it's how you come to them with that truth and um when you come to somebody with attitude telling them well you need to listen to me or da 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 da, -da and here's the truth they don't listen to the truth that you have to tell them because you already came at them in a very rude and negative way. So now you're not leaving way for the truth to be received. Um, so we are to deal with one another, believers and non-believers, with love. But that love um, needs to also be followed by truth. So love, when you respond and you react in love, it opens the path for truth to be shared and to be heard. When you don't sh um, start off with love, but you start off with like rude comments or hatefulness or spitefulness, you're now leaving that path closed and nobody wants to accept what you have to say. Nobody wants to hear what you have to say. And though you may be speaking truth to them, something that they really need to know and understand, they don't want to hear it. And for me, I think this is something that um, 
teachers need to learn because I know for me um, I, I was blessed enough to go to a charter school and my charter school was very small I was the third graduating class so when I got there it was only uh, fifth sixth and seventh graders um, so you know I kind of grew with my school and I was blessed because my teachers Anytime they had an issue with something that you did or something that you said, they never reacted in a rude way. They definitely came to you with the kindness of their heart. Um, they were very nice and sweet. And then they were able to correct me. And I was more um, accepting of that correction. Now, I know for public school, a lot of teachers are not like that. Um, they're very rude and nasty to their students. Their students um, then don't want to hear it. So when you're rude and nasty to someone no one wants to hear what you have to say be it truth or lie like it doesn't matter if you're rude and nasty i don't want to hear what you have to say and i know for me that's the case if you're rude to me um we have nothing to discuss i have nothing to say to you period but um the bible itself it says speaking the truth in love you lead with love to open the path for the truth to be shared and heard so nobody's going to listen to you if you're rude period so verse 15 I actually need to put that on my wall somewhere and make a, a wall art because that is so, so true. Um, so, lead with love. And when I say lead, I mean lead your conversations with love. Even if someone is making you upset, even if someone is doing something rude and nasty to you, don't respond in anger. Respond with love and it is hard. I know for me, it can be hard to respond and react and love when you've been hurt pissed off or whatever but the bible also says you can be angry but don't react in sin um not react in sin you guys get the gist of what i'm saying i can't remember the scripture <laughs> but there is a scripture that says that i think it's in the psalms if i'm not mistaken i believe it's in one of the psalms um so yeah lead with love as it opens a path for truth to be received so if you want somebody to receive what you're saying and you're really trying to get them to understand the truth of what you're saying speak to them in love period i mean it's as simple as that and then it says uh in verse 15 we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head so we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head um, so basically, mature dependent in him, not independent in him. Um, so a lot of people, they tend to think they can mature in Christ by being separated from Christ. Um, and that doesn't work. <laughs> you have to mature with him and be dependent on him in that maturity. Because um, when you try to mature outside or independent of Christ, you then rely on the world to help you to mature and that's not the way you should be maturing you should be maturing in christ with him and dependent on him so verse 15 mature dependent in christ and also god i'm sorry mature dependent in christ so that is that. Let me start putting some color down for my eyesight. Go crazy. Oh, yeah. It can definitely be um, a struggle, when, especially when you're arguing with somebody. I know for me, when me and my fiance argue, um, I'm the type to shut down. I don't want to talk, um, especially because he's, he's very much a blunt person. Um, he will tell you what he thinks <laughs> regardless. And um, I'm the type. I don't, I don't like confrontation. Um, <laughs> again, there's two sides to me. There's the shut down and keep my emotions to myself side or the lash out, react and cut you off type. And when I'm in a relationship with him, um, it's been six years for me. I shut down. He likes to talk things through. I don't want to talk things through. And it's not that he's rude. He's very much a very blunt person. And though he always means well, and, it's, it, and it doesn't even have to just be him. People in general, they can mean well, but how they present it can be off-putting to who you are so i tend to either shut down or tell you to get out my face <laughs> and in my relationship i tend to just shut down and don't want to talk about it because I, you, you just hurt my feelings like no i don't i don't want to talk but um I'm, I'm learning that that's not good um i need to talk things through but i don't like to that's just me but let's add some color because my page is starting to get on my nerve
So, no longer children to and fro by the waves, carried by the wind of doctrine. We're gonna do in this beautiful blue color. I also have a video coming out soon on BSF because I have been doing BSF and I have honestly been enjoying every second of it. Like, oh my god. Uh, I'm so happy that um, Bible Study Fellowship has finally opened it up to do um, online stuff because uh, it's been such a blessing to me learning new things about the word. Verse 12... Yeah, it definitely makes sense, Stacey. Um, you know, people react to things very differently. That that's basically how my fiance is. He's stern and he's stern but he's kind. But um even though he means well, I still kinda be like, No, I don't wanna talk about it because <laughs> you hurt my feelings. And it's not that he purposely hurt my feelings. He definitely always means things um from a loving perspective. But again, it's how you present things to people, it's how you um do things. I know for me, with my even with my siblings, I'm a very <laughs> I'm like you, Stacey, when it comes to my siblings. I'm very stern, but I mean it, you know, from a loving place. But to them, it's not presented in love. It's presented like I'm being mean or I have an attitude. And I, I, I started to realize that that's not good. Um, you know, my relationship with my siblings is good. But, you know, we love each other. We always have problems, siblings will. But I, um, I'm very stern with them. Very stern. <laughs> and it definitely doesn't presents itself in a good way to them so i'm trying to learn ways in which i can be um a little bit more loving to them <laughs> so you know that's something that i'm personally learning and trying to perfect because yeah it's not bad when well, my siblings some like my siblings it's not so bad uh, my siblings are very comfortable talking to me but sometimes you never know if you should say something to me because i might lash out and it's not like i purposely lash out it's just I'm lashing out from a place of love, but when you lash out, it kind of, it makes it hard for you to then co continue communicating with that person. So, I'm learning, you know. I have four, four, yeah, four younger siblings and a child. <laughs> so, I'm learning, you know. <laughs> but, um, okay. So, verse 16. Yeah, this is very, this, this is a long study. So, sorry, YouTube, if you're watching this on YouTube next week. It's a long video. My coffee is cold, but that's all right. So then it says, um, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I'm going to bracket this whole verse because I couldn't break it up. Like I just, I felt like it was too important to break the whole verse up. So I literally just like wrote the whole verse on the notes. So for verse 16, basically um, the fivefold ministry is created so that each person does their part in helping the body of Christ. Again, the body of Christ is not the church. <laughs> we are the church, but not the church building. Um, the actual like physical form of us as beings. Um, so the fivefold ministry was created for every person in that fivefold ministry, be it apostle, be it preacher, be it pastor, be it... Um, a teacher uh, be it evangelist be it prophet it was for them to help in the body of Christ to help it grow and function properly and again that fivefold ministry was created so that it can equip the Saints to learn to lead and to learn to serve um, so again the fivefold ministry created so that everyone does their part in helping the body of Christ to grow and function properly. There should be spiritual pro progress from the love created by the successful producing a love through our beings. Um, and the key word being spiritual progress. Because a lot of people, again, the book that we're reading, you know what? I'm going to go quickly grab that book because I'm talking about the book. But yeah, I'm going to grab that book. So give me like two minutes at least. Not even two minutes, a minute. So I have my mother's copy. Um, I have my fian I asked my fiance to buy me a copy because this is a, a book that's required of 
the ministerial board to read at my church. But um, this is a book that we're currently reading. It's called The Emotionally Healthy Leader. It's how to transform your inner life will... How to tra how transforming your inner life will deeply transform your church team in the world. And it's by Peter Scazzaro. Scazzaro. I don't know how to pronounce that. But, um, you know, in this book, he really talks about how um, we're supposed to be looking at the spiritual progression. But some people look at numbers. Um, they look at, like, the physical progression. They look at the numerical progression. And, you know, it's nothing wrong with looking at the spiritual and the numerical stuff like that. It's nothing, I mean, not the spiritual, the physical and the numerical progression of your, your church. It's nothing wrong with that. But that should never be the focus. You should be more so concerned about the spiritual progression. Are you, are the people in your church really learning? Are the people in your church um, moving from just being, you know, baby Christians to maturing in their walk? Are they now looking to be a part of um, a different organization or ministry within your church? Are they looking to um, learn to pray more? Are they looking to get more into depth with their Bible study? Like, that should be the goal of um, the five-fold ministry and making sure that it grow the body of Christ grows and functions properly. Um, and again, that progress only comes from love and then that um, successful producing of love through other people within your church. If you have a church and everybody in your, in your church is nasty, <laughs> like they got bad attitudes and they're really rude. And I mean, like, I don't mean within the church themselves, but I mean with other people, because, you know, you when you go to a church, it is what it is. Like, you're, you're going to be clicked up together. And what I mean is, like, when you visit another... Like, if your church visits another church, you can definitely tell that there's a different vibe between the church you're visiting and your church. It, it's just... That's how we're, you know, people are wired, unfortunately. But when you have a church visiting, how is your church? Is your church, you know, greeting them? Is your church loving on them? Are they being nice? Or are your church members just sitting there not saying hi? Are they rude? You know, and I don't mean like everyone in your church, but majority of the people in your church. Sorry, you guys, the pastor <laughs> just text my phone. Ah, okay, I'm gonna have to text him back afterwards. Okay. Yeah, because we have a meeting today for this retreat. <laughs> but yeah, he just sucks my phone. But um, if majority of your church members are very rude and nasty, then you need to reevaluate the spiritual progression of your church because um, love is God. God is love. Love is God. God is love, period. So if there is no love being produced in your church, you really need to try to figure out where you went wrong or where the people in your church are going wrong. Um, that was like completely all over the place. So I'm going to reread that whole part again. So the fivefold ministry... I'm going to write this out too, so. <laughs> Tanya, <laughs> listen, I, I like conversations. I do. I'm sorry, pa the passive administration is like <laughs> contacting me. Um, And I am a part of, I am um, the administrative assistant at my church. So, yeah, and then we're like, we're, we're planning this retreat. The retreat is literally on Friday. So it's a lot of last minute, like, finalizing stuff to do. So he's texting my phone and I need to respond. So, uh, I hope this does, this video does not cut off. Um, sorry guys, give me one quick second to respond. We'll do. Okay, this is. Uh, sorry guys. <laughs> I'm trying to respond to him quickly. And I will. Sorry if the camera is moving. I am trying to text on my phone. I hope he doesn't call me in the middle of this because that'll be funny <laughs> okay sorry guys i had to respond back but um okay 16 five-fold ministry 
need to make a trip to Michael's to get some blue microns. So fivefold ministry created. So each person does parts in helping the body of Christ grow and function. We know that my handwriting is always chicken scratch when I write these notes. So yeah, <laughs> it says the fivefold ministry is created. So each person does part in helping the body of Christ grow and function. Spiritual progress. From love created by successful producing of love through our being. So again, when you look at a church, it should be on a spiritual progression level and not from um, a numerical thing. Because I know some churches get caught up in numbers and, you know, how big they want their ministry to be and how many people they want in their ministry. But when you get caught up in things like that, you lose sight of each individual person's um, spiritual growth. And then it kind of makes your church become a club, if you will, um, a place where people can just catch up to talk about things or a place where people can come to play church. And you, you never want your church to be a place um, that's a playground. You want your church to be where people are actually coming to grow um, and they should be growing within the fruits of the spirits. They should be growing in Christ. They should be maturing in Christ. Um, when you're not seeing your ministry mature in Christ, then you really need to reevaluate yourself as a leader. And you need to, you know, have your members look at themselves. Because every church should be seeing their members grow in love. And if you're not growing in love, then something's wrong. <laughs> Period. Um, I mean, there it just is what it is. And when I say growing in love, I don't mean that you're not going to have, you know, members mess up every now and then. I mean, we all know Peter was a very nice guy, but Peter had a very, na very, very nasty attitude. He had some anger problems, you know, but he still had love. <laughs> he was one of Jesus's best friends. Like, come on. So, you know, I'm not saying that every church should shouldn't have one member that has an attitude. It's just it's not going to happen. The disciples were the disciples i mean the disciples were human but your church majority of the time should be full of love that's i, I mean that's really all that i can say so moving on we're now gonna <laughs> move on to the second to last paragraph we only have these two paragraphs left and we're done so i'm hoping to be done by 12 30 it's 11 44 oh god <laughs> so when i edit this video i might make it a two-part video so again sorry youtube <laughs> But um, let me just block this off with this bracket. Alrighty. So the last portion is called the new life. Um, so starting off with verse 17, it says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do. In the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Verse 19, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn. Sorry, going back. <laughs> Uh, verse 20, but that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So, un circling, sorry, not underlining, but circling. I'm going to go to verse 18 and circle the word darkened. Um, and hardness, yes, it's still in verse 18 as well. Going to verse 19, I have sensuality. 23, we have renewed. 
And yeah, that's it because I only have one word for the last paragraph. Okay. So again, I already wrote those down. But um, darkened is here. It's this Greek word and it means condition of moral or spiritual darkness, obscurity or blindness. Hardness, Greek word, and it's stubbornness or dull perception. Sensuality. Here's the Greek word, but um, it's inclined to lustfulness, wanton, or arousing sexual desire. And renewed is here. It's to be spiritually transformed, to take on a new mind. And that new mind is the mind of Christ. I should have probably wrote that in there. So, new mind, which is of Christ. So, I have all those written down. So, now we're just going to, you know, add some color quickly. This is for the last paragraph, but I'm going to just box that one now. And darkened. All right. Moving on. So, verse 17. It says, uh, Testify in the Lord that you must know no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their mind. So basically that we should no longer walk as if we are empty or without purpose. Because that's basically what we used to walk like. Um, and walk, as we defined already, is basically um, how we conduct our lives or lived. So we are not to live as if we no longer have purpose. Because now we have purpose. As believers, we understand that we have purpose. Um, you know, the purpose is to be one of God's kids. <laughs> Let me stop. No. The purpose is to um, help bring others to the kingdom of God, to expand the kingdom of God, um, to lead and to serve. That's that's our purpose. Um, and tell people about Christ and what he has done. Speak of God's love. That's basically what it's saying. Testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their mind. Speak of God's love. That's pretty much the uh, simplest way to say it. Is speak of his love. So, testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Speak of God's love. Live with purpose. Because, I mean, I know for me, back when I was in my darkened days, <laughs> is what I'm going to say, um, I felt like I had no purpose. I felt like there was no point. I felt very empty without anything. There was a big hole in my, my chest and I didn't know what to do about it. So I felt like there was no purpose to anything like at all in life. And, um, you know, when I took that time and was like, I'm sick of feeling the way that I feel. And I read the word of God. I started to understand that I did have purpose. And now that I understand that I have purpose, I live like I have purpose. And again, there are some days when I feel like I don't want to do nothing. It, it just, it is what it is. Hence why I forgot that we were supposed to have two sessions like two weeks ago. <laughs> but, um, you know, majority of the time you should live like you have a purpose. That you understand that you have a purpose. There's no need for you to feel like you're empty or without purpose. So. Then it says in verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding. So basically, their understanding was once blinded because um, they chose not to receive his revelation. When your understanding is darkened, um, it's, not that, it's not that you might not want to know, but sometimes you choose not to receive his revelation. So they are darkened in their understanding. Once blind, because can choose 
not to receive. And for me, I feel like this goes more so with people who um may have grown up in the church. I grew up in the church. Like my family was always in church. All my family members went to church. We was in church all day, every day. Um Sunday you had church, Wednesday you had Bible study, Thursday I believe was choir practice, Friday you had something going on with the youth church, and then Saturdays was dance rehearsal. So I grew up in the church, but you know, the older I got I just I um I chose not to really fully understand the revelation of God because I just, I didn't want to, you know, I made that choice not to. And, um, it wasn't, I don't think it was like a very intentional thing. It just was, I was more so in the world around the world world, and it felt more fun to be in the world. So because I was having more fun in the world than I was in the church and I, I you basically as a, as a, a teenager, I was kind of lukewarm in my faith. Um, I felt more fun in the world than I did in the church and I knew what the word said but I also knew that I wanted to have fun and the world didn't let me have fun so I chose to not receive the revelation of God I chose to not walk the way that he wanted me to walk and because I chose it I kind of got blinded um I lost sight and I kind of hardened my heart just a bit you know so um it's not always that you can't know because it's available it's it's there the cross Christ like everyone has that the, the 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 ability to understand the choice though is yours so if you choose not to receive that revelation you're not going to be you're not going to understand you're going to be darkened so um once blinded because can choose not to receive his revelation i think it will make me a fruit smoothie because i bought some fruits some frozen fruits i think that's what i want again random comment i know So let's go on with some color. I want to get the other pack of the mount liners because there's like a fourth pack. So I think I'm just going to reorder all the packs over to get the fourth one because I really, really love these highlighters. They're so good, especially the um fine the fine tip. Love them so much. Okay, then it says alienated from the life of God. So basically, when it says alienated from the life of God, basically you are separated from God and without eternal life. That's what that means. Um, I'm not going to write that down, but, you know, where it says alienated from the life of God, you were separated from God and did not have eternal life. Then it says because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of the heart. So ignorance and a lack of understanding is a heart problem. Th this is telling you that it's a heart problem. Um, stubborn. You can be insensitive to the spirit. You can be spiritually blind. It all has to do with the heart. And, you know, it says somewhere in the Bible, I'm I'm basically going to um, say it in my own terms, um, that the things that you think and the things that you say start at the heart. I, I cannot think of the actual scripture and where it is, but I know in the Bible it says that somewhere. <laughs> um, so, you know, the ignorance and lack of understanding in the hardness of your heart is a heart problem. So, um the ignorance that is in them due to their heart and hearts. So ignorance, lack of understanding. Can you see? Okay. I just put two S's, but I don't care. Understanding um, is a heart problem verse 19 do I have anything for verse 19 before I even read verse 19 no I don't we're skipping ahead now to verse 21 um, where it says we're taught in him as the truth is in Jesus so basically we are taught by Christ because he is the truth um, everything he spoke and teaches is truth. Um, so basically, everything that came out of the mouth of Jesus was extremely true. And I think the thing, anytime he said, verily, verily, I say to you, I feel like everything he said was already truth. But what he was getting ready to say after he said, verily, verily, I say to you, that was even like more essential than what he was already saying. Because if you're speaking truth, you are truth. I mean, you, you should understand truth, period. That That's pretty much all there is to say about that um verse 22 it says put off your old self so 
your old way of life, um, that's the past. Let it go and change your conduct. Change the way that you live. So for me, I have to um, let go of the way that I used to think. Because I was a very much down, pessimistic thinker. Um, and I still find myself doing that sometimes. But um, the way that I thought was very, like, negative. And I need to let go of that negative thinking. Um, I need to change the way that I think and make it more positive. And I find that it's personally hard for me to do that at times because I'm so used to thinking negative. Um, if something happens, I'm used to saying, okay, that's that's not going to work. That's just going to be it, whatever, blah, 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 blah. But now when something happens and I feel that negative thought coming to mind, I need to remind myself who I am. I'm a daughter of Christ. I am I am chosen. You know, I have purpose. I have to remember those things. And um, it allows me to help change the way that I used to think into the new way that I think. Then it says, um, belongs to your former self. I'm sorry, belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So the old you is the person that was inherited from Adam. So our old selves before we came to Christ um, was our inheritance from Adam because Adam and Eve ushered in darkness. Um, they ushered in death. They ushered in separation from God. So we instinctive, instinctively rebel against God. And um, you can see that with kids, um, with with. A toddler, when you ask, this is before a toddler can really communicate with people. If they want something, they take it, right? That's instinctive to them. I want it, so I'm going to take it. And this is before they can really see things in the world, okay? So if a toddler wants a cookie and asks you for a cookie and you tell them no, and they go into the kitchen to eat the cookie, one, they're being prideful because they want that cookie. So because they want it, they're going to take it and eat it, not knowing, like they know what's wrong, but they don't really know that it's wrong if that makes sense right so then they eat the cookie and then they lie to you about eating the cookie so how did they really learn to lie they didn't really learn to lie it's instinctive it's built within us because that was inherited from adam and eve adam and eve lied they blamed people they did things that they weren't supposed to do which ushered that into us so that's why they say we live in a world of sin we're born into a world of sin okay so um our desire is to please the flesh and not the spirit. That's a life of disobedience, and that was inherited from Adam. And we can read that in Colossians 3 and 8. I'm going to write all that that I just said down in a second, but um, I just wanted to say that. So, um, belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So, um, life of disobedience. What time is it? It's 11.59. Yeah, I'm hoping to be done by 12.30, so I'm going to stop rambling on that extra stuff and just keep pushing because this is very long. Um, so, life of disobedience. Uh, where was I at with these notes? Um, instinctively rebels against God. Inherited from Adam. Wrote that all wrong, but whatever. And Colossians 3, 8 is the cross-reference for that. And I do have cross-reference for every single verse. <laughs> I'm just not mentioning them. Um, again, they're on the notes if you purchase the notes. But um, yeah, I just... I used to enjoy flipping through the cross-references and stuff and mentioning them, but now I feel like, again, I mentioned this in the video when I talked about the changes with the notes. I feel like I'm doing a lot of the work, and I, I really want people to be able to do the work themselves. So I, sometimes I'll throw out a cross-reference if it's like very, very essential that I feel like you read that cross-reference. But other times I feel like you should take the notes and um, go back and study it for yourself further. That's pretty much how I did it with um, Ruth um, before I did the Ruth Bible study with you ladies. I did the Ruth Bible study with uh, Nora Conrad on YouTube. She had a, a Bible journaling video like this where she studied the book of Ruth. And, um, you know, I wrote down everything that she did in my old, my king my new king james sterling bible and um after we after i did that study with her i went back and studied it on my own when i was preparing to do the study with you ladies and then that's how i found other cross references and stuff like that so yeah again i'm gonna start with the side tracking so anyway um it says in 23 to be renewed in the spirit of your minds be renewed in the spirit of your minds 
Um, so basically, get spiritual renewal for your mind um, through studying the word, meditating on the word, praying, and reading your word daily so that you can keep your mind on the right things. Um, you need to be renewed on a daily basis, not a weekly basis, not a monthly basis. Um, yeah, also, I think it was Esther I was studying. Was it Esther or Ruth? I don't remember. It was one of those I did that way. But yeah, Tanya, um, it's always good to go back and just restudy it for yourself just so that you can you know, relearn. I know for me, I'm going to restudy Esther and Ruth because even though it's been some time since I've studied it, I'm reading um, fictional books on them. I'm, you know, doing some more in-depth studying. And the more that I study, the more gets, the more things that get revealed to me, um, especially with the comparisons of the Old Testament relating to Jesus. Right now, um, I read the books, um, A Light on the Hill and Shelter of the Most High by Connie Lynn Cassatt. I know so I, was, I wasn't going to go on a tangent, but this is the last tangent. Um, but I'm reading those. I read those two um, biblical fiction books and they talk about the cities of refuge. And I'm doing a devotional right now on the cities of refuge um, by Connie Lynn Cassatt on the Bible app. And um, I'm learning so much about the cities of refuge and how they really pointed to Christ. And a lot of the times we try to understand what the Old Testament has to do with Jesus. But um, I'm learning so much, so much. So I definitely love it when people go back and um restudy it i i don't well I, i'm not gonna say i do this but i know for church when i take my church notes my my whole point in taking the notes is to come home and study and i don't always do that i don't always come home and restudy the notes because then by then i'm doing personal studies and preparing for the bible studies and all that stuff but um even with church notes when you write those notes down you are supposed to come back and um you know study those things because when you study it again for yourself you're able to open up your um your mind further to understanding more and allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal new things that you probably didn't get when you was studying it at the time you were studying it. Yeah, Stacey, I, I always recommend that people do the study first um, and then watch the video and then probably go back after the video because <laughs> it helps. It I feel like it helps a lot. That's how I do it. Um, but, okay, so yeah, um, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So yeah, spiritual renewal is not just a one-time thing you need to do it every single day it is very essential that you do it every single day because if you don't do it every day you you allow your mind to um be open oh god i think my fiance is here oh lord <laughs> which is bad okay yeah my fiance is here lady so you're gonna hear him come in i apologize we're almost done though thank god so if he comes in and he's loud i apologize and i apologize on youtube <laughs> Oh, God. Okay. Anyway, so yeah. Uh, spiritual renewal is a daily thing. You ha you have to do it every day because if you don't, you're allowing yourself to be susceptible to um, easily be discouraged or uh, pushed aside or led astray. So, I hope it's not him. I hope it's a package, but I'm pretty sure it's him because he said he'd be here at this time. Yes, it is. Come in. Hi, I tried to be finished. I'm almost done. <laughs> I'm almost finished. So yeah, that was him, ladies. So we're, we're at the last paragraph, so it's okay. <laughs> Hi, Yolanda. Um, okay, so spiritual renewal. Is a daily... Thing. And the cross references for that is going to be Romans 12 and 2, which talks about the whole renewing of the mind not being conformed. And you ladies know the scripture. <laughs> um, it's just one of those scriptures that we know all the time. But um, in Colossians 3 10. And yeah, okay. So then it says, put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. So basically, the new you is a person created according to the image of Christ, which is instinctively righteous and holy the moment you receive him. It's a life of obedience. Um, so the new man can commune with God and it has no need to be ashamed or guilty. So our old selves before we have come to Christ, we're very, we're very ashamed. Um, we feel guilty. We feel just downright terrible. But then when you're saved, you no longer have to be ashamed. Um, not saying that we don't get ashamed because we do, but you don't have to be ashamed because God doesn't see. Um, how, how can I say it? Hmm. 
God is not going to condemn you, basically, the way the enemy will condemn you. When you're ashamed um, and you're an unbeliever, you basically condemn yourself, the enemy condemns you. But that's not what God does. That's not what Christ does. So um, the new you can commune with God, and it is a life of obedience. So let's write that here. Um, new you created can you see okay in the image of Christ it's instinctively I think I just spelled this wrong, but whatever. <laughs> Instinctively righteous and holy. It's a life of obedience. So, um, let me give you the cross references. They are going to be Romans 6 and 4, and then 2 Corinthians, right? Yeah, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. So, um, what verse was that? So verse 22, it just basically talks about your old self, which is basically um, what you inherited from Adam. Um, this is before you receive Christ. You live your life according to the inheritance from Adam. You're, you're instinctive, instinctively living a life of disobedience and um, rebelling against God. But in verse 23, they talk about the whole renewal of the spirit. And then in 24, it talks about, I didn't even underline it. Okay, great. <laughs> so put on the new life created after the likeness of Christ. I mean, of God and true righteousness. So in verse 24, it talks about the new you. So the new you, now that you um, have found Christ and you're saved, you no longer live instinctively as you did when you had the inheritance of Adam. You now have a new inheritance, which is of Christ. And because of that new inheritance, you're more bound to live a life of obedience and um, you're instinctively righteous and holy. Now, it's not to say that you're not going to mess up and make mistakes. We as Christians, we make plenty of mistakes. It is what it is. We do. But the difference is we're not being condemned to those mistakes. We're not being um, seen as less than. Regardless of our mistakes, God still sees us as righteous and holy because our new being is, uh, I guess, wrapped up in Christ, if that makes sense. So, color. We need color. We need color. No, not yellow. I'm sick of yellow. Let's add orange. So, put on the new self created by the righteousness and holiness. Um, that's not pretty already. last paragraph then we'll be done again i did not mean for this session to be <laughs> as long as it was but that's what happens when we get together and we chat about the bible <laughs> um and i like to make these sessions um easy to understand and try to bring things no i don't want to use that color no i don't want to use that color <laughs> um make it relate to you know present time situations because the Bible is oh we know that, but the scriptures still relate to what we experience in our lives. So the last paragraph, and I only have how many notes for that? Oh no, okay, we're just gonna. But last paragraph, ladies. So um, verse twenty-five it says, therefore having put away falsehood, let each one of us. Sorry, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Oh, see, I was saying that earlier. So there's the scripture right there. Right there. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hand so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear verse 30 and do not grieve the holy spirit of god by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor clamor yeah clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice final verse be kind to one another tender-hearted forgiving one another as god 
and Christ forgave you. So, circling words, the only word I have is grieve to circle. And I already gave that a color. I'm going to show you guys the... Uh, there we go. So, yeah, the only word I wanted to define was grieve. And the Greek definition for that is... Uh, here's the Greek word, but the Greek definition of grieve is... Um, to pain, distress, or vex, to experience deep emotional pain. Um, so keep that in mind, right? Because it's speaking in reference to the Holy Spirit. So um, going with verse 25, um, it says, having put away falsehood. So basically that means as new beings, we speak only truth as Christ did. Then it says, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So speaking truth, speaking in truth and of that, <laughs> Speaking in truth affects us all. You lie to one person, it trickles down to the entire body of Christ. We are of one body and spirit, and that one body being the body of Christ, and the one spirit being of the Holy Spirit. So we must be mindful of how we speak and what we speak to keep the body running properly. So I am going to underline all of this. Um, I'm going to do the cross-reference first, which is going to be Zechariah 6 and 16. And then I'm going to write, uh, be mindful of how I speak. You can say I, you, we, however you're going to write it. But I, I like to personalize my notes when I write them out to make them, um, you know, relate to me so that I can apply it, if that makes sense. But um, I speak... Of how I speak and what I say. To keep the body, which is the body of Christ, the people, us, uh, running properly. And for that, I can say, like, in the church, people are not mindful of how they speak to people and what they say to people. Um... You have people leaving the church from hurt, church hurt. You have people leaving the church because, you know, a pastor said something very rude to a member or did something rude to a member. So, um, you know, we need to speak in truth and be kind to one another within the church. It, it just, it is what it is. It needs to be done. But a lot of the churches are not like that. And again, we can ramble on, but I don't want to keep rambling because we've been rambling forever, which is why this session is so low. Yes, Stacey, I love the fellowship we have in this in this group. I love it so much, <laughs> which is why we always get caught up in rambling about things. I'm probably going to have to do a video one day where I just get on live and we just talk about anything. We might have to do that one day because I really do enjoy that. But going back, <laughs> verse 26, it says, be angry and do not sin. And this is from Psalms. Um, so this is in regards to Psalms 4 and 4 and then also in Psalms 37 and verse 8. Um, I'm going to write this on this paper. All right. Get this paper and write verse 26. So this is Psalms 4 and 4. I knew it was from the Psalms. In Psalms 37, 8. But, um, you know, it's not saying that we can't be angry as Christians. I mean, anger is an emotion. It is what it is. But what it's saying is that, um, you know, anger is... An inevitable feeling it's an inevitable emotion but because you're angry it doesn't mean you have to give way to sin it doesn't mean you have to react in a sinful manner and I know it's hard because I've done it um you say something wrong to me I'm gonna say something wrong back if you hit me I'm gonna hit you back like you know stuff like that so you know we we give way to sin but we really shouldn't it's not that God is saying we can't be angry because it's going to happen I mean Jesus got angry. He was turning type, t turning up tape. He was turning tabletops over, making whips to hit people. Like you know, Jesus got angry. Um, but in that anger, don't sin. You know, David got angry. I mean, and you know, he was a man after God's own heart. So you know, and I want to do a whole study on David because David is just amazing. I'm studying him now with BSF, and I'm just like, oh, David, David, David. David is an interesting guy. Um, anger, it's inevitable, but don't give way to sin, don't,
especially when somebody has wronged you um we tend to want to retaliate <laughs> and retaliating um is not something that we should do we should leave that to the hands of god but you know we as humans choose not to do that we want to retaliate because we feel like we were wronged so all right moving on oh uh, no we're still on 26 so then it says do not let the sun go down on your anger um as we are new creatures new beings we should know how to let go of anger and not to dwell on it and it has no place within us where the spirit of peace and love resides and again that's another hard concept because i know for me if you make me angry um i tend to hold on to that for a few days a few hours a few weeks a few minutes it doesn't matter um we tend to hold on to that and we d dwell on it and when you dwell on anger it just leaves way for the enemy to um allow more strife to come in between you and whoever you're angry with and it's kind of hard um to have anger in you when you have the spirit of peace and love because peace and love cannot dwell where um anger is so you know do not let the sun go down on your anger flipping this over verse 26 uh I'm just going to say anger cannot dwell where the spirits of peace and love reside. And it's kind of the whole, it's the same idea of how you can't have fear and faith residing together in your mind because they kind of cancel each other out. So you can't have anger dwelling within you because it cancels out the spirit of peace and spirit of love. Um, so 27, it says, and give no opportunity to the devil. So unchecked anger gives the devil a chance to step in and take hold of the situation to cause havoc. He should never have the chance to do so. Um, we are to basically to resist the devil. So give no opportunity to the devil. Verse 27, um, and obviously, you know, James 4 and 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee. Um, and then we also have Romans 12 and 19. So basically, hey sis, Tasha. <laughs> if I say sis, everybody's going to say hi. So hey, Tasha. Um, what was I getting ready to say? Resist the devil. How long has this love been going on? Oof long time um resist the devil unchecked anger gives him a chance to step in going to verse 29 um it says let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth let no corrupting talk comes out of your mouth. Basically, um, watch the words you speak, <laughs> period. Um, and you, for that, I only have a cross-reference. Verse 29 is going to be Matthew 12.34 and Colossians 3.8. You know, everything that comes out of your mouth needs to be life. Um, it needs to edify. It needs to help. It needs to teach. But a lot of the times when we're angry, we say things to be spiteful, we say things to be mean, to be hurtful, and, you know, that gives way to the enemy. Um, then it says, but only such is, but only, uh, where is that? Okay. But only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So basically, we need to impart grace into people. We need to speak life and not death. We need to give encouragement. We need to give um, kindness, speak wisdom, favor, and blessings. Um, so for that, uh, impart grace, speak life, edify. And we have First Thessalonians five eleven.
Then 30. Oh, yes, we're almost done. Um, 30 it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And that right there is something important. So, again, we understand that grieve is basically, uh, oh, what did it say? <laughs> um, it's uh, it, to experience deep emotional pain. So, this is a, a true emotional pain. So, are you really causing emotional pain to the Holy Spirit? Um, so, basically, it says, cause no pain or stress to the Spirit within you. Do not neglect holiness. Do not indulge in sin or do not do anything to compromise the seal that protects and identifies us as a child of God. Do not be carnal minded, but feed your spirit. Um, and we know I always talk about this, but a great one is sexual sin. Um, you know, we tend to like to please our flesh. It is what it is. Our flesh likes to be pleased. And we know that it's wrong. The Bible tells us that it's wrong. We grow up in the church hearing, hey, no sex before marriage, blah, blah, blah. But we tend to do it anyway. And when you do that, you're now causing pain to the Holy Spirit. Because as you're doing that, the Holy Spirit is doing it. And it's the Holy Spirit lives within you. So even if you're smoking weed, if you're drinking alcohol, um, even when you curse out of your mouth, the Holy Spirit is within you. So when you curse, you're now making the Holy Spirit curse and now you're grieving the Holy Spirit. So, yeah, we know we shouldn't do things, but we do it anyway because we humans, you know. So, verse 30. And the cross reference for that, my pen is running out of ink. Whoa. Or is it just writing wrong? Oh, well. Um, the cross reference for that is going to be Isaiah 7, 13. Yeah. Two more points and we are done, ladies. Um, so, cause oh, uh, of Charlie Kirk and all right. Sorry about that, ladies. <laughs> cause no stress or pain to the spirit within you. Uh, feed your spirit so we're supposed to be doing things that um feed our spirit and help it mature not things that will make it stress out and cry um the last part of verse 30 it says by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption um so the holy spirit is basically our promise for the day of redemption he is our counselor he's our guide our identification he's our protection he's our confidant and he's so much more he protects us um i'm sorry protect him as he protects you pr pretty much so um protect the holy spirit as he protects you and the last one we are down to the wire because i don't have anything for verse 31 so this is the last verse verse 32 it says be kind to one another tender-hearted forgiving one another as god in christ forgave you before i tackle that before we finish i need color i just i need color i hate all black stuff it bothers my eyes it makes everything look to chumbled i need to organize my bookshelf this week but i'm leaving <laughs> so i need to figure that out 29 is gonna be in this blue color And that bookshelf tour is coming. I recorded it, but then I hated the way it came out. So I deleted the video. <laughs> so I actually need to uh, re-record that video. But I want to organize my bookshelf in a more organized way. Just a little bit. I need to seriously eat. My, my stomach is just... I'm sorry, ladies. Every time I come on camera, I don't eat and my stomach just growls. I hope you guys can't hear it. <laughs> oh, that's embarrassing, but it's the truth. It is what it is. Okay, do not be angry. This is 20. I'm sorry, be angry, but do not sin. <laughs> not, do not be angry. Um, give no opportunity to the devil. That's 20. Oopsie. I did that on the wrong side. Shortly did. Let's take that back. 
use that for that. And use this brown. Alrighty. Uh, one more color. Okay, last portion. Okay, so I'm just going to reread that scripture. Okay, so it says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ forgave you. So basically, um, the new self seeks to reflect God by reflecting Christ. Do unto others what God and Christ did for you. Um, the pattern after... I'm sorry, we should pattern that after Christ. Let me restate that. <laughs> pattern after that of christ towards you so whatever christ does for you you are to basically do to others so um the new self seeks to reflect god by reflecting Price. Cross references are Matthew six fourteen, Mark eleven twenty five, Luke six thirty seven, and Second Corinthians six ten, and we're done. So I'm going to stick all this here so we're done for today that's chapter five um i will be on live tomorrow at 10 a.m again because <laughs> i can't do it friday since friday is a busy day um before we leave for the retreat so thursday we will be doing chapter five that way next week we can just finish off the chapter six but um yeah again if you need the notes it's on the blog um so yeah it's on my blog <laughs> um i'm just gonna fold this part in half so that i can just glue it later And if you guys are interested in knowing how I did this, um, I'll show you right now. But I'm not going to, like, glue it in. So, basically, you fold a piece of the paper. If I can get it right. No, no, get it right. Um, you would basically fold it so that there's, like, a little flap. And you would put tape or glue on this portion and then, like, literally stick it inside in the middle. So that you can flip it like it's a page. And then this page would be like paste it down. I do have a video on my YouTube channel about it. So yeah. And it's not an original idea. I found this idea from Jason Mayfield. From Grace for Life TV on YouTube. But um, yes. We are done for today. I will be back on tomorrow. And hopefully we can keep tomorrow's session down to an hour like we're supposed to. Because it's, oh, no, it's 33 verses. We might be just as long tomorrow. <laughs> But, um, yeah, that is it, ladies. Um, if you have any questions, you can always just contact me. I'm available through Instagram DM. If you want my number, you can text me. If you have my number, you can text me. Um, emails. I actually do need to answer some of y'all emails because a lot of y'all emailed me. So I need to answer them. But, yeah, I'm always available. And, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So thank you, ladies, for watching. Thank you, Stacey. You have a good day to all of you. Um, and, yep. Oh, yeah, Tanya. Jason Maysfield is awesome. I, I, I love watching his stuff. <laughs> and I like following him on Instagram. But tangent again. Anyways, I now have to go edit this long, super long video. And uh, take care of some stuff for church. And my phone is going to die. Holy cow. Let's plug this in before this cuts off on me. Okay, see, my phone was on 4%. So that would have been terrible. I would have lost all this footage. <laughs> so I'm going to end it here. And I will chat with these ladies tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Bye.